Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Please turn with me in your Bibles to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 1 and 2 this morning. I find after nearly nine years that I look forward with anticipation to this very moment. I love to sing. I love the worship, the singing part of the worship service, but this is the part I look forward to the most. Um, and it's as soon as I say that you are loved and you are prayed for and you're dismissed, in my head, I begin a, cl- uh, a countdown, and I begin looking forward to, to preaching the word again the next week. So, um, but that again, First Timothy chapter six. We're going to be reading verses one through two, and let us come before the Lord and pray for the reading and the preaching of His word. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for the ability for us as a church to come together now for eighty three years. For 83 years, voices have been lifted in praise to you in this very room. The instruments have changed and the faces might have changed. But Lord, you are the same God. And we continue to lift up our voices to you and submit our hearts and minds to your word. And I pray, Lord God, that today's service would be pleasing in your sight, not because we have done anything special, but we are worshiping you in a way that you have ordained for us to, in a way that is befitting of you, that our hearts and minds have been set upon you, that we have turned away from the outside world to fix our gaze upon the cross, which is our hope, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would use your word to instill into us the truth that you would have us know, and that you would use it to shape us more and more into the image of Christ, who is our King and Savior. And it is in His name we pray. Amen. First Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And the word of the Sovereign Lord reads, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers. And, beloved, teach and urge these things. This is the word of the Lord. Theology professor and author Andres Kostenberger once wrote, God's honor and the proclamation of the gospel are more important even than personal freedom. So I want to welcome back to this series titled First Timothy, A Plan for Church and Life. And I, I think it's fitting that we end up here as a church as we celebrate our 83rd anniversary because that's what we're talking about is the church. Um, we are in this series as a church family in order for us to all grow in our understanding of ecclesiology, which is a fancy way of saying our theology of the church. And as we've come to understand, the church itself belongs to God. It is His church. It's not ours. It is His church. And as such, it is to be and it is to do all the things that God says for it to do and to be. Which means we who are part of the church, grafted in, who are in Christ, part of God's Christ's body as part of God's family, we are to live in the church the way that God has ordained for us to. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that you, so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. You see, God has an expectation on how we live in and as part of the church, and it is our responsibility to seek to understand what that is. And the letter to First Timothy, I think, is a great book for us to walk through because it is the blueprint for the church and how the church is to be organized and how the church is to be led 
and how the church is to live as, as a corporate body, but also as individuals and how we as a church are to engage the world. And so with that, what we know is Paul founded a church in the city of, of Ephesus. And it was a thriving, gospel-centered church. When he planted, it was a thriving church that was really passionate about the gospel. right? And it was influential throughout Asia Minor. And Paul wrote a letter, actually, that we're familiar with. It's in our Bibles, the letter to the Ephesians. And he wrote that letter not to correct anything wrong with them, but to remind them of all that God has done for them and to call them to be grateful and to live in gratitude, but also to live in a way that's worthy of what God has done. Well, years later, Paul was released from his first imprisonment to Rome. And after that, he and his his young companion, Timothy, went on a missionary journey to check up on the churches that they had planted uh, throughout Asia Minor. And they found what what they found in in Ephesus was a church that basically is losing its way. Uh, And the reason for that is because the Ephesian church had allowed unqualified men to take up leadership in the church, and they begin to slowly and surreptitiously begin to teach false doctrines, which then begin to lead to infighting and chaos inside the church, and that also led to behavioral issues in the lives of the members of those in the church as well. And this prompted Paul to leave Timothy in that city in order to set that church right, to get that church back on track. And the first thing that that, uh, Paul did was to tell Timothy that he is to put an end to false teaching and to discipline false teachers. And then he was then he told Timothy that he had to make sure that the, the leaders in the church were biblically qualified leaders. Again, this is something that's almost lost on our culture, but the scriptures make it very clear that the leaders of the church, the pastors and elders, and even the deacons of the church must meet very clear biblical qualifications. And then Timothy, after that, was to deal with a number of behavioral issues in the church. And he was to do this through primarily through the preaching ministry of the word, but then also as then those who would not heed the word through loving church discipline. And Paul addresses a number of behavioral issues, including things like quarreling and immodesty and and people taking advantage of the church's generosity. And Paul tells Timothy to deal with these issues and insist that the church exercise loving church discipline with its members and even with its elders if they fall into sin. Well, in in today's text, there is one behavioral issue that Paul tells Timothy to deal with that was prevalent in the culture at that time. And before I address that particular issue, what I need to remind you of is that Paul and Timothy primarily at this point are dealing with people who are professing believers. And I say that to say is because I think this is something, the teaching in here is something we need to reflect on as believers but I'd be remiss not to take a moment and explain what it means to be a believer. And what it means to be a believer is to understand clearly what we started with today in our um, catechism is that all of the world has fallen into sin because of Adam, our federal head, sinned, and then we inherited his sin nature, but also by our own very will became sinners. And as such, all of us, every single one of us, then we're at odds with God in rebellion with, with God and deserving His full wrath and justice. All of us, not any one of us, were immune or excluded from that. We all deserve that, rightfully so. If God gave us what we deserve, when we, if God was fair, He would punish us all and send us to, to hell. But in that, we discover that truth and we find out that we can't fix it on our own. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough. We can't make ourselves right with God. We can't erase our sin, and we can't do enough good stuff to earn the perfect righteousness that's required to have a relationship with God. And and in that, we find ourselves hopeless. Then we finally see our need. Our need is for a Savior, for God to do for us the things that we couldn't do for ourselves. And that's what we got. His Son, Jesus Christ, came into the world to do all the things for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, lived the perfect life fulfilling the requirements of the law, upholding the covenant of works, doing for us all of the things that we ourselves could not do. And then, if that weren't enough, he went to the cross and he died to pay the penalty of our sin and took upon himself the full weight of the wrath of God, as it's it's been said. He drank down the full cup of the wrath of God for us. It is finished. 
And by faith in him, then, the great exchange, as Matt spoke of this morning, takes place. The great exchange, which is our sin is laid upon him permanently and forever, and then his righteousness is given to us as a gift. And so when we stand before God, we are perfect. Perfect. Not because of what we have done, and not because of what we will do as Christians, but because of what Christ has already accomplished in us. And the gift of that, then, is eternal life in the presence of God forever and ever. That is what we must confess and believe. As Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel, and then you will be saved. And that is what many in the Ephesian church has done. And so I want you to realize he's, he's talking to believers here. And so today's text, we see a behavioral issue that, that was prevalent at the time, and it was one that was affecting the church as well. And in fact, it was one, in fact, it was those who were slaves and who were bond servants were growing increasingly disrespectful to their masters, especially those who were Christians. And they were doing so on the basis of being in Christ. Now, one of the problems for us is we tend to look at a text like this from a 21st century perspective. It's really easy for us to read this and gloss over it because we're going to start in our century with our own perspective. We read through the lens of how we understand slavery in America and in our own history. And, and it's because of that we will tend to dismiss what Paul says in the text and we're going to miss the application that really is very vital for us in our own lives. And the reason why we're dismissive is because Paul in this text doesn't do what we expect him to do. Standing here as Americans in the 21st century going through what we did as a nation with slavery, Paul does not do what we would expect for him to do or what we would hope for him to do. You see, from our perspective, we expect Paul to say to all of those who are under the yoke of bondage to a master, we'd expect for him to say, rise up against your masters. Throw off the yokes of bondage. Masters, set your servants free. That's what we expect out of Paul as Americans, as with our self-righteous indignation, especially in our culture today, we would say that's what Paul should be doing. So we expect, but that's not what he does. In fact, he does the opposite. Look at verse 6, he says, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Paul tells those who are under the yokes as slaves. That's the, the literal translation, by the way. Under the yokes as slaves, that they are to regard or think of their masters as worthy, worthy of all honor. Let, let that sink in for just a moment. Paul says that those of you who are under the yoke. You were bond servants to a master. You were obligated to someone who is over you as a master. You were to regard them as worthy of all honor. This is not at all what we would expect for Paul to say. This is not at all what we would hope that the Bible would say. Now, the reason why we struggle with this and the reason why, why we become dismissive of this, Paul's message in regard to this is because we try to take our cultural understanding and our history and the tension that exists right now in our country over race, and we try to take that understanding and read that back into the Bible, into the text, and say that that's the context. But, that's the, but the thing we need to understand is that is not the context. We cannot look backwards from our perspective and read our own history back into this as the context. The context of these two verses actually is different. The context is life in the first century under Roman rule. That's the context. Right? The context is an agrarian society, agrarian society. I always struggle to say that. Agrarian society. A society that's built on agriculture. Right? The context is a time and a place where people would literally starve to death if that economic system fails. The context was a time and place where indentured servitude was a fundamental and necessary part of the economic system. That's just the realities. We don't have to like it. We can look back on it as snobs if we, if we want to, but that's just the way that it is. It was a simple reality. That is the context. Servitude, being a bond servant, was simply part of everyday life in, first century, in, in the first century Roman world. 
Now, the second thing we need to understand is slavery in that time was different in many ways than we think of today. Right? When we think of slavery, we think of the raced, the race-based chattel slavery in the Western world. We think of the African slave trade. That's what we think of, where African people would kidnap and sell their own countrymen, right? And then they would be taken and sold for a profit, and these people would then be treated not as human beings, but as property. The first century slaves were treated completely different than that. It was not the same. It's not the same idea, even remotely. In fact, first century servitude, for, for the most part, was not chattel slavery like Western slave trade. The slaves were actually not seen as possessions, but still as people, and they had protections. They were more like indentured servants, like we saw the early settlers to the American, Americas who sold themselves into servitude so that they could have passage to the, for, to the new world. Now, these were people who certainly were bound and obligated to a master, but they were people that also benefited in some respect from their arrangement. They benefited from their own work. In fact, people oftentimes sold themselves into slavery for their own benefit. Some would do so in order to pay off debts because there was no other way for them to do so. Some people would sell themselves into slavery to have economic security during a very difficult time, like a time of famine. In fact, a slave, oftentimes an indigent servant, at times was better off than a day laborer because they had guaranteed basic needs that are met. Things like food, clothing, and shelter. By the way, this is something that's lost in our American culture, but I'm afraid at some point in our future might become a reality where people finally realize there's a whole lot less that you need, right? That basic food, shelter, and clothing is what you need. Everything else is just a want, even though that we're being told they're essential basic human rights. Not to mention, there were laws, both Roman and Jewish, that regulated the treatment of bond servants. Many bond servants, you know, owned servants of their own. And many of them had property and then would eventually work and pay, their, pay the money to earn their own freedom. And so if we're going to understand what Paul is driving at here in this text, we need to apply the lessons of the individual's in the past. If we're going to learn from this and apply this to our lives, we need to understand the context of the first century. Not to mention, and here's the shocking part, this relationship of bondservant to master is an analogy of our own relationship to Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again because some people don't even think in terms like this. But it's the truth. This relationship of a bondservant to a master is an analogy of the same relationship that we have to Christ. Which is something, again, people miss. And people, I think many people don't want to see. You see, oftentimes people in their self-centered, man-founded, focused theology, they look at their relationship with Christ as somehow being equal with Him. Like when people say cute things like, Jesus is my homeboy. Right? Or they, people will think of Jesus that the soft-spoken, you know, long flowing hair, never ruffles anybody's feathers kind of Jesus. Or the Jesus who just is always there to smile and hug you and never has any, anything to say. The Jesus that doesn't offend anyone. The Jesus that never demands anything of anyone. This is a flawed view of Christ and certainly a flawed view of their relationship with Him. Understand, Jesus might call us friend, but He is still our master and king nonetheless. We are His slaves and his bond servants, nonetheless. I don't care if we don't like the language. That's just simply the, the analogy the Bible uses. We are bound to him, and he is certainly worthy of all honor. In fact, let's just see what the Bible says. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says of himself, Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. And the word that he uses here for servant is not the word diaconus that we're familiar with, which is the word we get deacon. He does not use that word there. He uses the word doulos, which is the word that's in this text, which means slave or bondservant. Paul is literally saying, I, Paul, a bondservant or a slave of Christ. Paul the apostle, Paul the apostle calls himself a slave of Christ. How much more then are you? 
But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul says, for, for he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant or a slave of Christ. Again, Romans chapter 6, verses 21 and 22. But what fruit were you getting at the time when from the things from which you were now, you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become what? Slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. Over and over and over and over again. The Bible is going to remind us that our relationship with Christ is like the relationship between a master and his slave and a bondservant. In fact, one of the most famous verses, one that people love to quote all the time in very difficult circumstances, is, is Matthew chapter 11. What does he say? Many of you can recite this by heart. Come. To me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We love that verse, right? But listen to what he says. Take my yoke upon you. Not the yoke he's carrying, the yoke that he owns. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What is Jesus saying here? The way to peace is to become my slave. The way to peace is to become a bond servant. Right? The way to true joy is not autonomous freedom to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. The way to joy is to become Christ's bond servants, that we come underneath His yoke, underneath His headship, underneath His lordship. That's why we confess Him to be both Savior and Lord. The relationship between bondservant and master is an analogy of a relationship with Christ, which means that how a bondservant lives in relationship to his master doesn't just have economic significance, it has theological significance. Which is exactly what Paul has been driving at. You see, what Paul has been getting at throughout this entire letter in this text, he's been emphasizing all along when he talks about pursuing godliness and living a godly life. That it's not just about a confession, but it's also about how you live. And how you live and how you behave has theological significance. Church family, if there's something you could write down to remember and put on your mirror to remind yourself of, is that statement right there? How you live and how you behave has theological significance. How you treat other people has theological significance. How you honor your relationships has theolo theological significance. Why? Because how you live is a reflection of what you actually believe. This is why we say, just because a person makes a profession of faith as a Christian, doesn't mean that they're really a Christian. Because anyone can say words. Anyone can get all emotional and teary-eyed and come forward at the altar. Right? Anyone can say, I invited Jesus into my heart. But that doesn't mean that they've actually experienced a heart change that's brought about by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that they're actually a believer. There are plenty of people who claim to have received Christ, but at some point in their lives, they live like demons, living like the rest of the world because their actions betray what they really believe. This is why the point that James, the brother Jesus, makes in James chapter 2 is so poignant. What does James say in chapter 2? He says, what, is, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can this faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking of daily food, and one of you is saying to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body and for what is good, I mean, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And for those then, well, wait a minute. I just confess that Jesus is Lord. He goes, you believe that God is one. Well, you do well, but even the demons believe and shudder. The point that James is making, that if you truly have faith in Christ, the fruit of your life will bear witness to that fact. 
Right? How you live and how you behave has theological significance. And it's a reflection of what you truly believe. And that is the precise point that Paul's making here. That's the, the point that he's driving at here. Let's look again at the text. He says, let all who are under the yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Now there's a lot here, but I'd like to unpack a big chunk of this really quickly. First of all, notice Paul says that, that masters are worthy of all honor. This is one of those places you cannot interpret your way around the text. Because it's not just some honor. It's not partly, you know, some of the honor. What does he say? How much honor? All of it. All honor. Please don't miss that point. He says they're worthy of all, every bit of it, all honor. Paul is saying that those who, who are masters, who have bond servants, are worthy, are deserving of all honor. That's, that's what it means. You, what Paul is saying to these people was you were to do right by your masters because he deserves all honor, all of it. He has a rightful claim to it. He is worthy of it. He deserves it. This is the truth, by the way, that the woke culture around us will choke on. This is a truth that, that turns critical theory on its ear. The, the theory that sees everything through the lenses of oppressed and oppressor groups. The theology that sees power iniquities as inherently racist. There are those who have embraced cultural Marxism in the church, and, that, and all it's doing is creating division amongst believers. But the scriptures themselves stand in stark contrast to this ideology that those who are in power, those who are in authority, those who benefit from the work and the labor of other people are worthy, are deserving of all, all honor. Please make no mistake what, you know, what Paul is saying here. And this word honor is the same one that was used of the, of, of the widow and of, of the pastors and elders in this, in this same book. With respect to widows, the word honor meant that the church had an obligation to value and to take care of the widows in the church, right? And then the word worthy was used of pastors. I mean, I mean, honor was used in context of pastors and elders, especially those that teach. And it says that they are worthy of double honor, which means that the church is to provide for their material needs and give them the proper respect. Why? Because they're worthy of such honor. But Paul says right after this that masters who possess bond servants are worthy of all honor or respect from their bond servants. What does this mean? This means that bond servants owed it to their masters to give their very best efforts. That they owed them their full loyalty. That they owed them their, their best respect. They owed them the honor that was due to them in every possible conceivable way. And the reason why Paul mentions this is because in a culture of bond servants, they were known to be disrespectful and lazy and unmotivated and disloyal. And, and many, not all, but many would, would only do what they were forced to do and they would just do so resentfully and half-hearted. But Paul is saying very clearly, you're not to be like them. You're not to be like those in this world. You are to live differently. You are to live and work in such a way that gives your master all respect, all due honor, and you are to give your very best service to your masters. That's what Paul is saying. Now why? Well, Paul answers the question for us. He says, so that, right, which is the Hina clause, so that, is a purpose statement, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Another way to say reviled is blasphemed. You see, what Paul is saying is you need to serve your master well and give them the due respect so that, that you don't cause the name of God or the gospel to be reviled or blasphemed on your account. That's what Paul is saying here. Honor your master so that God is not blasphemed because of you. The thing that we need to understand is the fact that if you're a Christian, you don't just represent yourself anymore. You represent Christ. 
in everything that you say and everything that you do, whether you like it or not. You were a reflection of Christ. In fact, that's what you were saved for. Romans chapter 8, the verse 28, which is the one we love to lean on. I love it, but we got to read it all. And we know, we're sure, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, what's the purpose? For those whom He foreknew, He predestined to be what? Conformed into the image of His Son. That's what we were saved for. To be conformed in the image of Christ. That's what it means to be Christian. It means to be Christ-like. This is what we were saved for, to represent Christ to a dying world. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God, not the result of works, so no one may boast. For, because, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for a purpose, for the good works which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Bond servants serving their masters well in all respect is part of the good works that God had prepared beforehand that they would walk in. And this is a reflection of Christ in their lives and, their, and their, by their work ethic and how they treat their masters. They're to do so in a way that doesn't impugn the name of God or the gospel that they profess to believe. You see, there's nothing more hypocritical or inconsistent than someone who says that they believe one way, but then live completely differently. It's the very nature of hypocrisy. And what Paul is saying, shirking your responsibility, rebelling against your masters, being disrespectful, being disloyal, all the while saying Jesus is Lord, is hypocritical to its very core. In fact, not only is it hypocritical, it's downright blasphemous. I don't know if you realize this. Paul is telling bond servants and the slaves that if you don't serve their, you don't serve your masters well, you are responsible for God's name and the gospel being blasphemed. You're guilty of blasphemy. Now, this is a truth that Paul is communicating that has more important for us today than you might think. Because even though this, this truth, this truth, even though that we don't have a system of bond servants around us, there's still application for us. You see, when you put this bond-servant-master relationship in its proper context, you put it in a context for today so that we can understand it and make sense of it, what we see is this relationship is more like employer and employee. This relationship, in a very real way, is more like employer and employee. Because the fact of the matter is, if you work for someone, you're bound to them in some level. You're dependent upon them for some level. You're obligated to do something on some level. And by the way, you benefit from that. And this is the reason why you keep doing it, right? Because of the paycheck. But it actually goes deeper than this. This relationship is really applicable of all of our relationships that involve someone who's in authority and for someone who's under some sort of authority. Like a soldier and a commanding officer like a motorist and a highway patrolman, like a student and a teacher, like, like a congregant and an elder, like a, like a player and a coach, like a volunteer and a director, like a union worker and a business owner, like a child and a parent. We can go on and on and on, but it's the same exact structure. In essence, the essence of this relationship is there is someone who is in authority and there is someone who is under that authority. And that is the essence of what Paul is getting at. And what Paul is saying is the one who is in authority, whether you like them or not, or whether, they, whether you feel they like you or not, is deserving of all honor and respect. They are deserving of the very best that you have to offer by the way of your service. And it's that way for two primary reasons. Number one, when someone is an authority in your life, and I want you to hear me on this, when someone is an authority in your life, they are there because God appointed for them to be there. This is really where we often want to overlook this, especially as Americans. But the truth is those in authority are there because God has appointed them to be there. Romans chapter 13 reminds us that there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. 
Now think about what this means. Your boss is your boss because God ordained it to be that way. Your teacher is your teacher because God put them in your life to be there. Your parents are your parents because God decided for it to be that way. Your supervisor is supervisor because God placed them there in your life by His sovereign will and according to His own plan. And as such, because of that very fact, they deserve your full respect and your best efforts all the time. They deserve all honor. That's number one. Number two, the reason why those in authority in your life deserve the best you have to offer is so that God's name and the gospel will not be reviled or blasphemed because of you. This is a sobering truth, by the way. This is a truth that should make us all sit up and take stock of our lives because we live in a culture, right, where it's in vogue to dishonor those in authority over us. It's, it's popular now. It's, it's like all the rage. Look at, look at the way people treat police officers. And I'm not talking about just criminals of, the, of the, back in the day. We're talking about just average Joe person. They decide that it's, it's their job to now to police the police and get in their faces and spit on them and just be disrespectful. What blatant contempt and disrespect for those in authority. If there is a profession that's more disrespected and reviled than, than law enforcement, I don't know what it is. I really simply don't. And we see it all the time, people yelling and harassing officers just trying to do their jobs. But it's not just a cultural thing. Even many Christians don't seem to have a problem with people being disrespectful to their bosses and their supervisors, right? Because they're just, because they're just a bunch of idiots anyway, right? I mean, they don't know anything up there. I mean, they're going to tell me what to do, but they don't have to do my job, so why do I need to listen to them? Right? Why should I try hard for them? They don't care about me. Why should I respect them? They don't respect me. Even worse is many people who call themselves Christians encourage their kids through their own words and through their own actions and attitudes. They encourage their kids in some ways, whether overtly or subvertly, to push back against the authority of teachers and to push back against their coaches and to push it back against, their, against game officials. We even see many people who claim to be Christians being wantonly disrespectful of law enforcement themselves. And they get pulled over for a ticket, yelling and screaming and berating. But hear me, all of this not only dishonors those in authority, it dishonors God Himself. Because every relationship we have with someone else in authority is a picture of the relationship that we have with Christ. And again, I think that bears repeating. Every relationship we have with someone in authority, every relationship that you have with someone in authority is a picture of our relationship with Christ. Just like marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, our respectful submission to those in authority is a picture of our relationship and our humble service to Christ Himself. And to be disrespectful and to be disloyal to those in authority over us is to be respectful and disloyal to Christ Himself. I mean, you know I love you, right? When you refuse to give all honor to those in authority in your life, you are guilty of causing the name of God to be blasphemed because you are an ambassador, a representative of Christ Himself. You are one of His children and are a reflection of Him. When you refuse to give honor and respect to those in authority in your life, be it your boss or your teacher or your coach or your principal, you are guilty of reviling the name of God. That ought to make you shudder. Now, as Christians, we are very quick to jump on the sandbag wagon and point out the heinous nature of sexual sin, rightfully so, and we're quick to decry violence and the murder, the murder of innocence. By the way, there's been 4.4 worldwide COVID deaths this year, or since the beginning of the pandemic. But this year alone, from January to August, there have been 27 million babies murdered in the womb. So we'll decry violence and the murder of the innocent, but we will wink and even endorse the sin of blasphemy that results from our lack of respect and effort towards those in authority. And parents in this area, we really need to be careful and do some soul searching. When we do not correct our children's disrespectful behavior towards those in authority, we are encouraging them to sin against God Himself. 
We don't think in these terms because we don't actually stop long enough to read the Bible and apply it to our lives and understand it from that perspective. But we can't take part of this and say that belongs to me and then ignore the rest of it. When we don't correct our children's disrespectful behavior towards those in authority, we're encouraging them to sin against God. When we don't insist that our children give their teachers the proper respect, even a teacher that's demanding, even a teacher that's hard to get along with, we're encouraging them to, them to rebel against God and the ordained authority that He's put in their lives. It's the same as rebelling against God Himself, by extension. But even worse, when we are professing children paint for the world a false picture of God by our actions, we're causing them to stumble. Because that's what we do. When we don't give them the proper respect, what we're saying about our God is He's a God who encourages rebellion, a God who encourages disobedience. The late R.C. Sproul, quoting John Calvin, actually wrote this. He says, To dishonor our supervisors today, as with the slaves dishonoring of, of his master in the first century, falsely depicts Christianity. As if God, whom we worship, incited us to rebellion, and as if the gospel rendered obstinate and disobedient those who ought to be subject to others. Our failing to give all honor to those in authority and making us, makes us guilty of presenting a false God and a false gospel to the world around us because how you live reflects what you believe. And that relationship between you and those in authority reflects the relationship of you and Christ. And if you say you believe Christ is worthy of all honor, then you ought to live in a way in your relationships with those around you that you're bound to that honors Christ. Now, does this mean that we have, does does that mean the Bible endorses slavery? No. We can do a study on that and you'll find that the Bible does not endorse slavery. It was a reality. Does this mean that we are to allow people to abuse us? No, there's no such cause for that in the Word of God. Does this mean that we're to allow people, you know, to to allow ourselves to be treated unfairly at work? No, doesn't mean that we're not supposed to stand up for ourselves when we're being done wrong. Does this mean that your kids must submit to the immoral and illegal whims of predators who disguise themselves as authority figures? By no means, not even close. We teach our children to have a healthy respect for, for everyone, but also to keep a healthy distance and have healthy boundaries. And then as a church family, we have a zero tolerance policy for anyone that would cross any of those lines. Does this mean that we we must obey the government mandates at all costs, even when they're in conflict with God's law? Not even close. Paul himself says we're to obey God and not man. What is what this means in the first century and what this means for us today, is those who are in legitimate, in legitimate authority in our lives are to be considered worthy and deserving of all honor. And our actions and our attitudes and our words ought to reflect that that, that as we bear witness, our actions and attitudes and our words ought to reflect that reality as we bear witness to the character of God and His grace in our lives before a dying world. Now, as hard-hitting as that might be, there's one more thing that Paul writes here. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So one of the things that the church faced was the fact that a number of bond servants who had believing masters began to think that uh, because of their spiritual freedom in Christ, they now were absolved of their earthly responsibilities and their physical requirements to their masters because now they, they were all one in Christ. I mean, because didn't Paul say in Galatians chapter 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, nor no male or female, and you were all one in Christ, which is true. He did say that. But this still doesn't absolve anyone of their earthly obligations. You see, when you see, there were some who who would demand their freedom from their masters in the name of Christ rather than fulfilling their obligation because they began, they believed that being a Christian removed that authority structure in their lives, or somehow, some way that their master was obligated now to then give them their freedom. But what Paul is saying is the exact opposite of that. He says, 
that they are not to use that their equal standing at the cross to demand their freedom, but rather they are more obligated than ever to serve with even a greater enthusiasm and to a greater degree than before. And the reason for that is that they're rendering service not to just some stranger or to some person, but now they're rendering service to their brothers in Christ. And by the way, that should mean something. They're family in the Lord. And that means they deserve even better. That means they dare to serve at a greater degree. Why? Because not only are they serving out of obligation to their master, which is an obligation that they owe, they also ought to be serving out of Christ-like love for their brothers and sisters. As Jesus says, what? In John chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another like, you know, like you love each other. No. Jesus said, just as I have loved you, just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. By this, the people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. We're to love one another with a Christ-like love, a sacrificial love, a giving kind of love, a serving kind of love. And Paul is saying that, that you that you already need to give honor to all those in authority over you, but for you who have Christian masters, you need to go to the next level and serve them to the greater degree because you are now serving your brothers and sisters in Christ. You owe the debt of love to them. And so as we consider that in our own relationships, not only are we obligated to our bosses and teachers and principals, and whoever else might have authority in our lives, we owe a greater debt to those than who profess the name of Christ, who were our brothers and sisters, who ought to get the very best out of us. So then how do we, what do we do with this? Again, as the church moving forward, looking at the text and seeing how we're to live and behave in light of God's word. What's the application? Well, number one, we need to submit to the authority of God's word and submit to what it teaches. The thing is, is as Christians, what we have to come to terms with is the Bible is theanustos. It is the very breath of God. It is all His Word, and it is all authoritative, and it is all inerrant, and it's all applicable to us, and which means we need to obey it all. We don't get to pick and choose the parts and pieces that we like and don't like. We need to submit to the authority of God's Word and submit to what it teaches. And number two, we need to examine ourselves in light of what God's Word says. Right? That's the point of the law, right? Is The law is not a set of rules that we keep and try to live up to to say to ourselves we can't do it. The law is a mirror by which we see our reflection and see where we fall short. We need to look at the Word of God and see where we're falling short and ask ourselves a question. Am I really honoring God in my relationships with other people? Because that's the first question you ask. Not just am I honoring other people, am I honoring God in my relationships with other people? You have that perspective, everything else around you changes the very nature of all your relationships begin to change. We need to examine ourselves in light of God's Word. And then, number three, we need to live this out. Now that you know this, now you need to apply it. You need to live it in your life. Now, again, I want you to understand, this is not a legalistic kind of thing. Hey, if you don't live this out or you fail at this, you're not a Christian anymore. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is, as God opens your heart and illuminates your mind and helps you to grow and the Holy Spirit convicts you in this area, then you submit your heart to God's changing and leading and say, Lord, change my heart here because I see where I need to grow in this and I'm going to do the best I can to walk this out, but you're going to have to actually change me to do it because I can't. And then finally, brothers and sisters, this is where, where the church is sorely lacking. We need to teach it to our children. This next, I mean, I think every generation has been able to lay claim and say that the next generation after it was a bit more disrespectful than the one before. But I'm going to tell you right now, what we're seeing today just, I think, takes the cake. How, 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 how kids just will oh, blatantly stand up and just berate their teachers and assault them. How, how kids will just blatantly stand up to all authority figures, including their own parents. I want to tell you, I've seen videos of, of kids telling their moms to shut up at the top of their, their, their voices that make my teeth hurt because I'm waiting for my dad to come punch me in the mouth. You know what I mean? Because I know like, that that's exactly what it would have happened. Right. We as a church, we as Christians need to be the ones who are discipling our children in this, that we need to teach them to have a healthy respect for all those in authority. By the way, 
Anytime you teach a child to actually be respectful, they automatically have a leg up over everyone else. Why? Because they say, look how respectful that child is. Nobody expects it out of them. We need to live this out and we need to teach it to our children. Right? And then, as an added bonus, we need to live as the light of Christ. We need to live before a dying world. The fact is, the dying world around us is always frustrated. The dying world is always at odds with authority. The dying world is always complaining and griping and talking about how everything's horrible and awful. We need to be a light that shines the light in the darkness. We need to be the ones with the good attitudes. We need to be the ones that are showing hope. We need to be the ones that are respectful in doing the things that we're called to do. We need to be the ones that lead by example because we are a reflection of the Savior who redeemed us. And why would we do that? Because He is ultimately our master and He is worthy of all that honor. Let me pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.